Looking for a better sleep? Try Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers and get seven forms of magnesium in each capsule. Click the link in the description or pinned comment to save 10%. Maya, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for our chat. You started a podcast. I'm curious, what was the inspiration behind that and how's it going? Yeah, I started my Ambiolics Breakdown. Um, I guess it was born during the COVID year, as it were. Um, a lot of people that I knew were experiencing anxiety and mental health challenges. And for those of us who've been experiencing them, um, it, it's been a, a lot more of the same and also more intense. But it really struck me that a lot of people just don't know many basics about mental health. And so that's how my Ambiolics Breakdown started. And we're on Spotify and all the places that people get podcasts. And um, I also have a YouTube channel. And so we also broadcast it as a video. Nice. And how are you enjoying the medium so far? Um, you know, I, our, our studio is much fancier than I thought it would be. So I have to wear more makeup than I <laughs> thought I would have to for a podcast. Um, but I love it. I mean, I love that we get to interact, you know, with listeners and we have a, an ask my Am anything function on our website, which is bialicbreakdown.com. And, um, you know, it's been really amazing having people open up about their mental health challenges, the guests that we've had, and, um, seems to really be, you know, touching people. And that's really beautiful. And mom, you've been very open for a long time about your mental health struggles. And I'm curious, how far back does that go for you? When's your first recollection of of starting to feel, you know, something's a little bit different here. And, and I feel like I'm struggling. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like knowing that I was struggling. I mean, I remember, I remember crying on my 10th birthday, because I had this, you know, this really concrete notion that, you know, we're, we're all going to die. And while that, you know, can be the indications of a, you know, a thoughtful child, um, I think I always kind of tended towards that sort of, you know, heaviness and, and kind of depth of thinking. Um, you know, a lot of things that I did as a very young child, I didn't know were OCD. I just thought it was the things that I did, you know? So I think a lot of this stuff you learn about later, uh, about diagnoses and such, um, you know, the thing about being a child is like, whatever you experience is kind of your normal, you know, there's not always a sense of perspective. Um, I assumed that, you know, no one knew what was going on in my head, just like I didn't know what was going on in other people's heads. But my teen years was, you know, when I when I actually sought help for the first time. And later on, talking to your parents as as you're going through this, did you find out that this was something that ran in your family? Or is it kind of just beginning on your generation? No, I mean, this has been in my family, you know, probably for as long as my family has existed, you know, um, I mean, my, my grandmother was clinically depressed, actually, both, both of my grandmothers, you know, met the criteria for severe clinical depression. Um, my dad's father was a very complicated, I mean, really, like all my grandparents had stuff and, and many of us do, but, um, you know, suicide has touched my family more than twice. So, um, you know, we definitely, some of the younger cousins and younger generations started talking more about patterns that we see, but, you know, I think even to this day, I don't think that my mom would even identify. I mean, I've talked to her about it. You know, she just thinks like, oh, I'm just like, you know, life's complicated, but like, she's a nervous wreck. But I don't, I don't think she would ever say like, I have anxiety because it's not part of that vernacular. Like that's not that, that generation often has a very hard time. So yeah, I think it's more of a, a newer thing in terms of diagnoses. And then talk about this year, well, actually last year, 2020, the pandemic and your specific, you know, challenges and ebbs and flows throughout that year and, and how, how you're doing these days. Well, I think that, you know, the, the sense of isolation that, you know, that this year brought to many of us, even for those of us who are introverts, it's been alarming, you know, it's been very startling to not have the kind of stimulation, you know, even to get out and be able to say, oh, I need to go back home now. Like this is too much. Um, so I think the lack of kind of choice in being able to choose when and where you take your introvert self, I think has been hard for introverts. For extroverts, I know that, uh, and, which I'm not one, I just figured I'd give them a shout out. You know, I've heard people say like, I just miss people. <laughs> I just miss hugging people. And I'm like, what's that like? <laughs> um, so, you know, for me, there's a lot about being home a lot that has been really pleasant and has felt really calming for my nervous system. Um, you know, my world's gotten smaller in a lot of ways and my 
my social calendar is essentially empty except for my children and, you know, visiting my mom in her backyard once a week. So, um, you know, it's been, there's a loneliness to it, but also, you know, life slowed down a lot. And I guess for that, I'm trying to find that silver lining, but my anxiety has been off the charts, um, both because of the anticipatory, you know, anxiety just from a global pandemic and as well, you know, without getting too political, like no matter what political party you identify with, it's been a very rough year. It's also been a year that has seen the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, um, bring the country to its knees, rightfully so. There's been a tremendous amount of, of turmoil and, you know, even conversations about the vaccine and will we get it and who's going to get it and how, you know, I mean, it's been very stressful. So I've had a lot of, you know, kind of classical spikes in anxiety trouble sleeping, trouble eating, um, you know, feeling jittery in the middle of the night and also wanting to kind of numb out just with like scrolling, 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 scrolling. And and what have you done in a healthy way? Have you upped your self-care, done anything, you know, consciously to give yourself that extra love during this time? Yeah. I mean, honestly, like kind of giving myself a break and, you know, reminding myself, I don't need to also prepare the perfect meal, you know, every night when I have my kids um, you know, so kind of uh, relieving some of that general pressure right now has has been helpful. Um, you know, I've taken a deep dive back into puzzles because that's a really good thing for my brain and my hands. It keeps my mind, you know, occupied instead of kind of spinning out. Um, I do have um, some women that I mentor. And so our, our friendship and kind of fellowship has gotten really strong this year. Um, yeah, those are kind of the biggies, trying to get into nature as much as I can. I, I also am I'm working, so I work a lot. But really slowing down, trying to have good quality time with my kids and not stressing so much about them wanting to play so many video games because we don't need to fight all the time. And that's kind of what I realized could easily happen right now. <laughs> well, talking about fighting, I know you have a somewhat unique way of raising your children and disciplining them. So let's talk about attachment parenting. This is something you've, you know, put yourself out there and talked about. And I'm just curious, where does that stem from? Is this something you knew you wanted to do before you had kids or as you kind of got into parenthood, realized, you know, this classical way that most people are raising their kids just isn't going to work for me. Let's talk about the evolution. When did, how did that come on your radar to start? Yeah, I, I had friends who had kids before me um, and you know, definitely had some friends from the Bay Area, you know, that's the San Francisco Bay Area who, you know, ideas flow freely in the Bay. And so I had, you know, friends who had the first home birth I had ever heard of and friends who were doing, you know, safe bed sharing and, and uh, extended breastfeeding and like breastfeeding on demand. It sounded crazy to me, to be honest with you. But what I saw is that as these, as these um, friends of ours, you know, started raising these kids and we were still, you know, young and, and childless, um, what I saw was that there was a kind of communication um, shorthand that seemed to be really working for these friends of ours and their kids. And as these children got older, they were um, exceptionally sensitive and articulate and compassionate. And while what it looked like was early extreme dependence on the parent, um, these children grew into very independent, confident, you know, loving, sensitive little people. And so I started reading more about attachment parenting. And honestly, I was a grad student in neuroscience and we study neurodevelopment and embryology and um, attachment theory is a real thing. <laughs> so that's not, you know, kooky science. That's the notion of building a secure bond, you know, and, and the fact is a lot of our parenting that we think of is, is really, it is very Western centric and um, it is not the way that people parent all over the world. You know, the notion that children should be sleeping independently, eating independently and reciting their alphabet, you know, by the time they're one and a half is really a Western, you know, a Western notion that is designed around concepts of success and productivity. Um, and so, yeah, we, we decided to raise our kids uh, according to the principles of attachment parenting and many, many people do. Uh, I'm also a lactation educator counselor, so we do connect very strongly with the bonding and parenting that comes with um, breastfeeding, especially breastfeeding on demand. 
Um, my children are now 12 and 15. They are both weaned and have been for many years. They put themselves to sleep. They don't sleep in bed with me. Um, they are very, very independent little people and they're very sensitive and, and tender and articulate. And there are many ways to get children like that. But I know that for my kids' personalities, this has been the kindest way um, to raise them. And while it's not so important you know, anymore to think about the natural birth and home birth decisions that we made and the breastfeeding decisions, um, the notion of gentle discipline is still something that you lay the foundation for, you know, um, so that by the time they're 12 and 15, hopefully they still are talking to you, you know, the way that that is helpful for all. And what does gentle discipline look like? I know the basics is not hitting, which makes total oh, sense. Sure, and right. then <laughs> that's a pretty common sense. And then, and then no timeouts. I'm just curious, how does, yeah, how does this work I mean, then? What are the boundaries? Um, <laughs> there are a lot of boundaries. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually pretty strict as a parent. You know, the idea is that, um, you know, there's a, there's a relationship that you build with your child, you know, in their formative years, um, so that the language surrounding what you need from them, what you ask of them, and what you'd like from them, um, it's it's a different kind of system. It's not an authoritarian system, which doesn't mean that the child is in charge, or that the child doesn't do what they you know what they want to, and they get to run the house. Um, on the contrary, we have plenty of boundaries, and um, you know they they knew from a very young age what behavior was okay and what was not okay. But yeah, the, the notion is we did not utilize um, timeouts. We don't utilize, um, you know, kind of, um, I don't want to say nonsensical, but to say to a child, if you don't stop this behavior, you can't have dessert. It doesn't make sense to most children. I mean, it doesn't make sense to most adults. So trying to have related consequences for um, behavior is important. And I'm not saying that we don't remove children from situations where they're being, you know, destructive or disruptive. Um, but the notion of having kind of this, you go sit in the corner concept is not something that we tend to utilize. Can you give, you don't have to use even a specific example from your own life, but I have a young daughter now and this, this is intriguing to me. I'm curious, like when somebody, when a child does do something that is totally disobeying what the parent wants, what, how does that look? Um, well, I mean, in the moment, obviously it looks like making sure no one gets hurt. Um, you know, my, my older son started, uh, he had a wooden train set as many children do. He had a wooden train set when his brother was born and he just, you know, as an expression of a lot of feelings, he started throwing the, the train cars and, um, you know, obviously I stated, we don't throw train cars. We try to avoid using the word no. Because often when you keep saying no to a child, what you get is a child that constantly says no. So, um, so you know, statements like that. And look, it takes a lot of communication. But, you know, um, the second time he threw the train car, I very calmly took all of the train cars and placed them on top of the refrigerator where he could not reach them. And what happened was he was extremely upset, you know, for about three minutes. And I was with him when he was upset. Um, he kept asking me to take them down and he got more and more upset the more I wouldn't take them down. But eventually he stopped crying. He calmed down and the train cars remained up there for, I don't know, a couple more days. And um, he, he never threw a train car again. Now, I'm sure that there are many examples where this doesn't work for people. For our child with the dialogue that we had set up, it it did work for our child. Um, and you know, as I said, it's not always easy to have related consequences for behavior. But um, one of the things that uh, programs like quality parenting teach is that when a child is, quote, misbehaving, it's almost always not about that. Um, so if a child is having um, a power struggle with you, it's usually because they feel oppressed, you know, in a child way. Um, if they're wanting attention, you will likely feel annoyed meaning usually you can judge what they need by how you feel. So when you have a child that's constantly tugging at you and doing things and you're just like, oh my gosh, I need a minute, um, that's usually that the child needs more attention. And of course, you can't always give as much attention as a child um, wants or needs, but um, reframing their behavior in terms of what need they're trying to get met to the best of their ability um, is also just a helpful place to start. And as somebody who's done so much throughout their career in so many different avenues, I mean, you're an actress, you have a PhD, you've done a lot, you're, you're a mom of two. Where along the journey did you have kids? 
And then how did you manage to be so attached to them and still be so productive and, and continue on all these different things that you were doing? Um, so I, I, the answer is I actually didn't get to do all those things. I had my first son in graduate school. I had finished my course curriculum, which meant that I was in data analysis and writing phase. So I was able to um, write my thesis, essentially laying down while breastfeeding. Um, but my first son was born in grad school. I filed my thesis, defended my thesis, and then took my doctoral hood about seven months pregnant with my second. And um, I was home. I was home with both of my children. I left academia. I did not pursue a postdoc. I made a very difficult decision, which may not be the right decision for everyone, but it was the decision for me. Um, and I was the primary caregiver for the first two years of my younger son's, my older son's life. And then um, the first year and then, you know, kind of on and off as I started working again for his second year. Um, so, you know, there's a tremendous amount of sacrifice involved with being a parent at all, no matter how you do it. Um, but for me, I, I did make the decision to leave academia so that I could be physically with, um, with my kids. And, um, I did go, I, I taught, I sometimes taught with a child strapped to my chest. I tutored, um, piano and Hebrew, and I, I designed a neuroscience curriculum for junior high and high schoolers in our homeschool community. I did all of that while being the primary caregiver. Also, my kids didn't eat solids or even drink water until their second year. So I was physically um, the sustenance for each of my children exclusively for the first year. So, um, and we didn't use bottles with um, our first son at all. So yeah, it's a very uh, physically attached uh, existence. And was that hard for you in the beginning, at least being somebody who's such a go-getter and, you know, you've done so much by that point in your career and for your age to, you know, slow down, not obviously a mother is, is super busy, but in a different way. Was that hard for you? It was, you know, it was, I know that it's harder for other people than it was for me because I, I already knew that growing a human and then birthing a human was not going to be the same life that I had before. And one of the reasons that, you know, I am such a believer in, in natural birth and, you know, home birth and things like that, um, is it does force a preparation and a consciousness on you that already indicates that it's time to shift into a different phase of life. And, you know, I'm 45 and I know that especially for young moms today, you know, the notion of like, my life has to change can, can feel very oppressive, you know? Um, and this is why many people choose not to have children because, you know, it's, it's not the same as not having children. So for me, you know, I was really blessed with, you know, a mother who valued both her feminism and her career, but also really valued being a mom and a homemaker. So I was raised with a real reverence for that. Um, and our culture does not really have a reverence for that. And you can see that reflected in maternity leave and paternity leave and the way we, you know, lack the way many families lack protection to build a family when a baby is born. Um, you know, many Northern European countries are are really ahead of the curve in this, in terms of understanding that having a baby is, it's a shift in life for the entire family. And, you know, having a government that supports that is really, really um, important. So for me, I kind of was preparing for that. And again, in the, in the natural birth and home birth and midwifery communities, that is something that you're, kind of trained for, um, that kind of preparation, especially as you prepare your body and your mind, um, you know, to manage labor without drugs. And as a celebrity and somebody in the spotlight with young children, how did you navigate that whole world? You know, people probably would, you know, want to see your young children and take f photographs of you guys. And how did you go about navigating that, especially as somebody who thought differently, more alternatively, how did yeah. you how did you shelter your family from that at that time? Well, I mean, keep in mind I wasn't that famous then. You know, I had been on Blossom and I took 12 years off. So, um in many in many ways I was just a normal, you know, frumpy <laughs> frumpy mom. Um my when my older son was born, we didn't even have smartphones. I didn't even have a laptop. Like no one did. I mean, sorry. Fancy like computery people did. But like your average person, like we didn't have any of that stuff. So there was no 
notion of like internet, like paparazzi weren't following. That wasn't my life. I was out of the spotlight. You know, that's kind of why I left the industry because <laughs> I like being out of the spotlight. Um, and then I went back to work on Big Bang Theory when my younger son was about a year and a half and I was made a regular around when he was two. Um, so yeah, I never kind of had that level of fame that, that Jim Parsons had, or, you know, it was, it was never really like that. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful, honestly, that my kids are older now, because it is very hard, you know, to be in the spotlight when your parent is, when you're young. And given that your kids are still relatively young, how do you go about guarding them or protecting them from, you know, going online and using Google or social media? And, you know, being somebody out there, a public figure and a celebrity, you know, people are going to say good and bad. Do you worry about that and what your kids are going to come across when they're when they're online? I do. Yeah, I mean, my older son has um, has a phone and, um, you know, I, I would say while my children aren't perfect and I'm sure, you know, we, we will have, you know, the we will have conflict. They're, they're not angels or saints. Um, we have raised them with a very uh, I don't want to say aggressive, but we've raised them with a very specific notion of the Internet and, and access to information, not specifically around me, but really in general. Um, it was actually my older son who told me that he was hearing people talk about that I should host Jeopardy. And that's actually how I called my agent and said, my older son saw on the internet that I should host Jeopardy. So should I host Jeopardy? Uh, maybe we should make a call about that. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff does worry me. And, um, you know, I'm grateful there's no naked pictures of me on the internet, which not that there's anything wrong if you want to take naked pictures. But for me, I'm glad that like, that's not something I have to worry about them seeing. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we teach them to take everything with a grain of salt and, um, you know, they, I think they're the meanest to me of anyone. So. Are they, are they into big bang theory? Do they give you props for that? No, they, we didn't have them. They didn't watch big bang theory. We're not really a TV watching family, so they actually hadn't seen it. Um, they just had never watched a sitcom. We're just really not TV people like that. So they saw some episodes cause they would come visit me at work. Um, but no, they're not really TV watchers. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I know their friends are my older son in particular. Well, I've heard you even say you're not a fan of watching your work afterwards, which I find so hard to believe you put all this time in and, and you're on this popular TV show, Big Bang Theory. I mean, how do you not get peaked to see, you know, what, what's making the final cut and, and how that turns out? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people do watch themselves. My feeling is like, my job is not to watch myself. My job is to, you know, say my lines and hit my mark and, um, you know, make you feel something, make you believe something, you know, entertain you. Um, but no, b beyond that, it's really for me only frustrating to see what, what got left out and what, you know, I could have looked different and why does my hair look like that? And, you know, <laughs> by the way, did you end up hosting Jeopardy? I will be filming it after Call Me Cat wraps. So the show that I'm working on ends in March and I'll do it right after that. Nice. And I'm just curious, Maya, this alternative view again, coming back to this, your, you know, the way your attachment parenting and your your thoughts on breastfeeding. And I mean, these these are views that are very in sync with the way I think and, and the way our family runs too, but they're alternative. And I know part of your story. They're actually the most natural way to <laughs> uh, raise children and give birth and feed them. I like won't deny that, of course. But do. they're still considered at this point alternatives. Correct. And, and yeah. I'm just curious because I know part of your story, your parents were, I think you've used this term, hippies. And yep. I know part of their story was they were filming documentaries of Vietnam back in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s. They were teachers. Do you think, part of why you are the way you are it quote unquote alternative stems back from, from the way you're raised. I mean, I could say yes, but I also know plenty of people who are part of our, you know, holistic community who were, you know, raised completely conservative. So I, I don't know that, that it's necessarily linear that way. Um, you know, my, my ex and I joke that our kids are probably going to like rebel and be really straight laced, you know, <laughs> and, like listen to pop music instead of all the alternative stuff we've been trying to get them into. Um, but you know, I, I definitely was raised to blaze my own trail, you know, and 
I was raised by, um, as I said, a mother who was very, very traditional. She was raised Orthodox and, you know, she was raised to cook and to clean. And she passed on all of those very domestic things to me. But she also was very outspoken and, um, you know, didn't want kids when she got married, which was considered, you know, scandalous to get married at 18 and not have kids right away. Um, that's not why she got married to my dad. She got married because she wanted to get out of her parents' house. But, um, you know, she was a very independent spirit. So I definitely get that from her. Um, but, you know, I have an older brother who's not holistically inclined. So, you know, we were essentially raised the same. So I think it's it's also, it's it's who you run into. It's what resonates with you. Um, I've just always been, I guess, kind of open to alternative stuff and I'm really grateful that I had an open mind, you know, enough to listen from these friends who I, I thought were absolutely nuts. <laughs> well, another alternative piece that I want to get into a little bit is the homeschooling. And I know mm -hmm. a lot of people these days, given the pandemic, are, you know, homeschooling more than usual. At least I'm assuming that's the case. My daughter's too young for school at this point. But how did that all come about? And again, with all these different aspects that you're doing, and again, they're not, this is over a number of years. You're not doing all of sure. these at one time, but you are, you are a go-getter. You're getting a lot done in your life. How, how did you fit that in? And, and why was homeschooling important to you? Um, well, yeah, I mean, in the early years, um, well, we, we, we kind of resonate with a Waldorf Steiner philosophy, um, which is, um, you know, Waldorf is, is famously known for no electronics and no batteries and no logos and um, natural toys and really kind of a, a simplified parenting style. Um, a lot of people also talk about Rye education in our circles, which is resource infant educators, um, essentially like not hovering over your child constantly and letting them really explore and, and kind of do things on their own. So those kind of two philosophies were introduced to us, um, you know, pretty pretty young. I was very drawn to Waldorf philosophy and we did a parent and me program. And one of the neat things about Waldorf is um, they don't emphasize academics for the first seven years, which is not to say that children don't learn or that they don't go to school or, you know, do things that are important. Um, but that philosophy really informed a lot of our decisions about how much we needed to worry about academics for a two-year-old or a three-year-old. Um, and we met, again, we met people who had been homeschooling and we were struck by um, how, um, you know, articulate and studious that their children were. And we loved learning about the opportunities available to children to learn in groups of children of different ages, which often happens in homeschool communities, kind of more of an old schoolhouse method. And we loved the notion of parents teaching in a co-op, which we were part of when our, you know, when our kids were little. And the idea is having positive control over what your children are learning and how. So um, it's been very interesting to hear people also talking about wanting to educate their kids, for example, about Black Lives Matter, um, you know, in a way that that traditional schools don't. And for those of us who homeschool, we've been able, you know, to to include the kind of learning that we want, you know, from from very early on. Um, my ex-husband was the stay at home parent and he still is an at home dad. Um and that's the way that most people homeschool is with one parent working and the other not. So the notion that that what people are doing during COVID is homeschooling is actually not giving them enough credit because it's impossible to call yourself a homeschooler while having two parents working or if you're a single parent to be working full time and trying to school your children. So what we're all trying to do, you know, who, who are not homeschooling, meaning people who are having to learn homeschooling, um, you know, this is, it's an exceptional situation for which you need to have so much gentleness around your situation because no homeschool family I know has two working parents and, and they're trying to fit all the classes in. Um, you know, we, as homeschoolers, we do have communities that we're part of where we get together with other families and have park days, you know, a couple times a week and classes in the park. And obviously we can't do any of that now with COVID. So we have turned, you know, to Zoom. But also when you homeschool kids, they are raised to believe that adults will be around, adults can be relied on, and also adults have adult work that they sometimes need to do, and you need to, you know, have activities and a mindset that allows you to play on your own and to work on your own. Um, so that's another thing I'm hearing from a lot of people that their kids are kind of like, so mom, what are we going to do now? You know, and homeschool kids know, like, this is our home day where I'm going to do all my chores and you're going to be over there and we'll meet up for snack, you know? Um, so I, I have, I mean, I taught both of my children Hebrew and I was their piano teacher and, 
um, you know, as my work life got harder, I was, you know, able to be involved less in their kind of daily class stuff. Um, but their dad does do that with them. And um, we use Khan Academy, uh, which is an online, you know, math um, learning service. And we use books from the library. We don't use a strict curriculum. We're technically unschoolers. Um, but, you know, my older son will be likely starting community college classes is some, somewhere between 15 and 16, which is what a lot of, um, you know, focused homeschool teenagers want to do. And uh, both of my kids were late developers, which is actually one of the original reasons that we homeschooled them. If we had put them in traditional schooling, they would have both been forced to do all sorts of therapy, um, which they essentially did not need. They simply needed time to grow into their bodies and their brains. Um, my ex-husband was also a late developer. And so our kids just needed more time. And it was really nice to not have to put them into, you know, a structure that would already say you're behind. Um, and also we couldn't afford private school is also one of the other things. Um, we didn't believe also that you should have to pay to have a good education. And so um, we kind of, I guess, took matters into our own hands. You mentioned there your son going to community college after being homeschooled. Is there certain kind of testing that you do to be able to get back into the regular system or how does, how does that look? There's, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting kind of conversations about this in terms of some colleges waiving SATs and, you know, um, there, there are more and more homeschool teenagers entering, you know, these systems. So you can get transcripts. So we, we do have, um, schooling and formality. I've written rec letters for homeschool kids cause I've taught, you know, junior high and high school. So I've written rec letters for colleges. Um, you know, the college system really is adjusting, to um to a lot more homeschoolers coming in and the fact is we feel like it's our responsibility to you know prepare our children for whatever they want to do and if that means that they want to learn you know and be able to take the SATs then that that is it's our responsibility to teach them well it's interesting earlier when you talked about the fact that what parents are going through these days is more challenging than typical homeschooling I'm curious, once we find out what the new normal is, once things settle, you know, whatever that is after the pandemic, I wonder if people are going to be more inclined to homeschool or not. I mean, if they've had a bad experience and, and they yep. think this is what homeschooling is, it might turn off a lot of potential people that could have, you know, bought into that system. What I've, what I've heard more is from people who didn't know how much they like being around their children. Um, I'm actually hearing that more and more, even from you know, even from professional people, lawyers, um, you know, people like that who normally work a lot of hours saying, gosh, why are we sitting in a car? Why are we why are we carpooling like this to, to just put our kids in a place that we don't know what they're doing all day? And then they come home and we wonder why we don't feel connected, you know. Um, so I've actually heard that. I've heard also from a lot of people who have kids who've had learning challenges um, that it's been really helpful to see that with some more hands on time, their children are actually thriving. Um, and I think that's very important. You know, there's been a real reckoning in this whole year. And Maya, I'm sticking with this alternative theme. We got to talk about the diet. You're eating a vegan diet. I want to know how far back this goes and how did you get turned on to this again, alternative way of eating? Um, <laughs> I, let me think, um, I became vegetarian when I was 19. Um, and it was, you know, I had always been uncomfortable eating animals, but didn't know that there was an option not to, because the house I was raised in, like you eat what's on the table and please don't complain about it. So, um, when I, you know, left my parents home, I became a vegetarian. I still ate dairy and eggs. Um, I was one of those people who was always getting sick. I always had sinus infections. I was on antibiotics so much, like so many sinus infections and a young doctor at UCLA when I was a freshman there said, have you ever thought about cutting back on dairy? And lo and behold, uh, turns out I had a dairy allergy. And what that looked like for me was not like lactose intolerance. That's a separate thing. Um, I was allergic, meaning um, I produced a tremendous amount of mucus <laughs> and got sinus infections from dairy. Um, I figured out that certain dairy that was kind of heavily processed, I could eat, meaning like the things that were worse were like mozzarella, ice cream, milk. And I was raised literally glass of milk every night and no one wondered why we were always sick. So um, when I got pregnant with my first son, um, I was still vegetarian. When he was born, any dairy that I had um, made him sick, made his stomach sick. And he was very fussy and unhappy. And dairy is one of the most common allergens for babies. So I cut out dairy and um, it solved a lot of 
his health stuff. He also has eczema. Um, if he accidentally has ingested dairy, so he gets eczema patches from that. And I cut out eggs. Yeah. A couple years after that, when my second son was born and, um, I, you know, I still had been eating like trace dairy, meaning like if it was in a candy bar, but like, it wasn't like milk. Um, but I, I cut all that out. It just became, you know, instead of trying to decide where the line was, I just like erased the line. That's kind of how I describe it. Like, Oh, do I eat these chicken eggs? Like, do I eat those eggs? Like, what if I eat this dairy and it's like hormone free? I just like, it, it was too stressful. And the regulations of organic and not organic, it was just getting too controversial and complicated. So um, now I, I don't feel guilty. Like now I don't have to worry. I don't think about it because I don't partake in it. Um, so yeah, my children are vegan. They're both um, healthy. They have, you know, shiny hair and plump cheeks and they've got color in their, you know, in their face. Like, um, you know, B12 is one of the things that we don't get. Um, you can get it from not washing your vegetables fully because there's B12 in dirt. Uh, but you, you can easily take a B12 supplement that's, you know, highly absorbable and um, all sorts of other things. Then we're very healthy people. <laughs> there it is. That's great. And do you get any pushback from the kids eating this way or they've always gravitated no, towards it? I mean, it? look, they, they were raised in a time when every single food exists vegan pretty much. Like they don't really remember a time when they couldn't have vegan pizza or, you know, and now you can just get it in, you know, in our local supermarket. It's such a, especially in Los Angeles, it's, they eat so many things. Um, you know, we're not super, 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 super healthy, you know, um, vegan. I don't mean to say we're unhealthy. I just mean like my children do eat processed food. They do eat processed vegan cheese from time to time, you know, and they do have soy sometimes. <laughs> so, um, no, I mean, I remember when they were little, sometimes it was hard at birthday parties, but like literally it, it wasn't that hard. We would bring them a treat that they could have. My kids don't really have a sweet tooth anyway. Um, but no, they figured it out and they know we taught them from a very early age that like, this is one of the ways that we honor the planet and, and the animals on the planet. And, you know, um, animals are friends, not food. <laughs> and food aside, what are some of the other self-care practices that you do on a regular basis? Meditation, gratitude, yeah, some I of the started... classics. Um, you know, I did, um, I started meditating. I use um, Insight Timer, which is just like a free app. They don't pay me. I, I say that they should for how much I use them. Um, I do guided meditations. Um, I read Sharon Salzberg's books about, you know, meditation, just like learning to breathe and quiet your mind. And, you know, I'm one of those people who was like, this doesn't work for me. I don't like it. Um, but it's a practice. You have to practice and um, learn to slow down. Um, I do yoga. Um, I you know, pretty standard Hatha yoga. Um, I, I do Taekwondo. I'm a brown stripe belt. So that's something I try and keep up. Um, and I go to therapy, um, can't miss therapy. I go twice a week. Um, and what else? I, I don't watch a lot of TV. I, I like documentaries. I do puzzles. I try and keep my life, you know, as uncomplicated as possible socially, meaning I don't, you know, do a million things anymore. Like I used to when I was young. So that's pretty good. <laughs> and I know religion's a big part of your life. And I'm mm -hmm. curious how that fits into this whole piece of well-being and, and maintaining how you feel day to day. Yeah. I mean, I know that religion's not for everyone. Um, and a lot of people feel spiritually inclined, but not religiously inclined. Um, you know, the the religion and ethnic people that I'm part of are a very ritual-based people. <laughs> Um, you know, I'm an Eastern European Jew. I'm a combination of Polish and Hungarian and Ukrainian. And, um, yeah, that is a huge part of my life. It's a huge part of sort of finding my center. And, um, you know, I miss, I miss being able to go to synagogue because we were a family that had really gotten into a good rhythm of going every Saturday. And, you know, that meant that that was most of Saturday and it was very easy to turn off my phone because I was in synagogue, you know, praying and singing and dancing and hanging out with friends and um, really missed that structure, you know, now that we're um, in a pandemic. So, so yeah, I mean, religion is still a, um, you know, religion. And again, my kind of ethnic identity is, is a very important part of my life. My younger son is studying for his bar mitzvah, so I'm tutoring him for that. Um, so that's keeping us busy and um, his Hebrew is getting really good. So that's good. <laughs> and growing up, was your family really religious? No, my mom was raised Orthodox. My dad was raised, you know, more progressive. Um, they're both first generation Americans. And 
there were a lot of leftovers from orthodoxy in my childhood um, that my mom didn't always explain the significance of because it was just kind of how she was raised. And I think she had a lot of, um, you know, guilt about not being religious anymore, like she was raised. Um, so I was raised, you know, more traditionally. We observed holidays. I was raised kosher for most of my life. And, um, you know, my, my parents didn't have a particularly strong faith in God. But I'm grateful that they had me attend synagogue anyway, because it gave me some structure and it gave me a foundation to to build an ethical framework and a, a spiritual framework for my life. So I'm very grateful that they did that. Um, yeah. And I know obviously part of your story then is you became more observant as you got older. Was there a certain turning point there or was it just kind of a gradual, a gradual, you know, pull towards the religion? No, I mean, I think like I, I met the first modern Orthodox rabbi that I had ever met. He was the rabbi at UCLA. That's where I went um, at the Hillel, which is a you know non-denominational progressive um, organization that fills the needs of all kinds of you know Jews on campuses all over the world. And it was the first time I met someone who was like drunk on knowledge. Like he was so captivating and captivated by. Um, not just the liturgy, but the philosophy and the intellectual pursuits um, of this religious tradition. And, you know, he taught in the law school and, you know, he was a professor. And um, I wanted to be around someone with that kind of intellectual, you know, um, excellence. So I started hanging out at Hillel and I, you know, answered phones and I volunteered there and just hung out there a lot and um, started learning. And it was really through the you know, the learning system of Judaism, which is very specific, um, that I, that I really kind of fell in love with this lifestyle. And as somebody who's also heavily into the science, do you find there's ever any conflict there between the religion and the science? I mean, if you're looking for the Torah or the Old Testament to explain the natural world, you're probably going to have a lot of problems because it's not a science book. Um, no, I mean, the more wonder I have for the human experience and the human body and the human brain, the more I know that um, I didn't create this. <laughs> and the more I learn about, you know, nature and, and the beauty of the human experience, the more I appreciate, um, you know, how much the human brain can grasp. And I, I find that all divine. I want to come back to your podcast and the title being Breakdown. Is was there a point in your life when you did have a breakdown, or is this just referring no, to? I, I it's, it's a good title, a, but I'm just curious. Yeah, does that it's refer a very to good a title? Um, no, I didn't have a formal breakdown. I mean, I've had lots of you know falling down, as the Buddhist saying is, you know, fall down nine times, get up ten. Um, no, I mainly wanted to be able to say I'm Mayan Bialik and welcome to my breakdown. <laughs> um, but no, not a not a proper um, breakdown, as it were. And as somebody who, again, has struggled with mental challenges at different times throughout your life, how do you go about, like we've talked a lot about your kids, how do you go about observing them and making sure, you know, helping them curve them away from that path if possible? Obviously, you can't, you can't handhold them and make sure that they, they don't have challenges. I mean, mental health challenges are part of life for everybody. But how do you how do you help as somebody who might have some genetic predisposition to that? How do you help guide your kids? Yeah, I mean, trying to keep an open line of healthy communication with them is really important so that they know that it's okay to talk about your feelings um, and that they know that it's okay to not be okay. We do have a family therapist that we work with um, who can kind of, you know, help when things feel too confusing for me or my ex to handle. Um, but you know, it is important to name feelings. I was not really an overly talky parent. You know, a lot of parents are very like, this is the sun, the sun is a circle, the sun is yellow. You know, I, I was not a very talky parent like that. But when it came to, to feelings and emotions, I made sure to give them a vocabulary so that they have something, you know, to build from and be able to talk from. Um, it's also very, you know, the more time you spend with your kids, the more you hear what's in their head and what they're listening to and what they're picking up on. So a lot of times I'll also catch, you know, especially my older son, my younger son doesn't have a phone, but my older son, you know, he's on TikTok and, um, you know, he, he's on Instagram, you know, he sees a lot of hyperbole, um, especially around mental health, you know? And so, um, 
I make sure to try and stay in touch with him as much as he lets me so I can clear things up. If he says like, oh my gosh, she's so OCD. I'll say like, ah, let's talk about OCD. Like someone can be meticulous. It doesn't mean they have OCD. Like let's use the gym. I'm that mom. I'm a very obnoxious. <laughs> and OCD is actually what you did your thesis on. Mm-hmm. At that That's right. point, were you already diagnosed with OCD or was it something you figured out later? No, I figured it out later. I mean, you know, I, I knew that I had been, I knew the behaviors that I had. It wasn't until I did a consult with a psychiatrist who asked me very, very specific questions that um, it became clear to me that, oh, I think I actually fit this diagnosis. What do you think about that? <laughs> and is there a specific part of your self-care protocol that you find helps keep your mental health in balance? Um, I mean, I guess therapy. You know, like, I mean, I've, there have been periods of my life where I've um, not been on medication, where I have been on medication. I happen to be on medication now. But um, yeah, therapy is kind of the thing that teaches me the most, um, you know, accurate vocabulary for, for what I'm going through at any given time. Let's talk about the new sitcom. You're still filming that right now, right? First season. Mm -hmm. how, how is that going? I mean, now you've done multiple sitcoms. So how, how does this one compare in a pandemic compared to in the past? Oh gosh. I mean, filming during pandemic is really, really difficult. Um, you know, we don't have a live audience, which is really a huge part of the sitcom experience is the live audience part. So, um, you know, we're working with writers, not able to be on set. We're working with, you know, um, everything being harder because very few conversations can even happen in person. So everything's kind of, you know, done by, um, by zoom and, you know, notes are given by phone. It's just, it's a very different world, but, um, we're having a very good time and we really like each other. The cast gets along very nicely, which if we didn't, I wouldn't say that. Um, we actually do. So it's been really beautiful for us to, to work and also to employ the hundreds of people that it takes to put a, you know, a show on the air. And how has the audience been responding to it? Um, I mean, our ratings are holding, so it's kind of, you know, we just have to hope that people want to keep coming back. It's been doing pretty well. And I think a lot of people feel really seen, you know, with a character like this, who's, um, who's very quirky and very herself and, um, people seem to be responding very well. So we're, we're very pleased. Good. And what's the name of the show? It's called Call Me Cat and it's on Fox. Nice. I checked out the first episode. Very cute. Very nice. Yeah. Is, is so like would you say, a, would you say a lot of your personal traits are brought into this character? Yeah, I think there's a lot of me in this character. Um, our creator is a woman named Darlene Hunt and she's very, very quirky and awesome. And she's put kind of like the, the quirkiest parts of her and the quirkiest parts of me together. And that's what we've got. Um, so, you know, this is a character that's playful and klutzy and I'm definitely both of those things. So, <laughs> so what's, what's in the horizon for you? You're obviously focused on this right now. We're in a pandemic, but down the line, we're, Again, you're you're in your mid forties. You've done so much, but where? Yeah, what do you, what do you see yourself doing? I'm just, <laughs> really? I'm ready to retire? I feel like I've done enough things. Do you have um, anything? Do you have any other big goals that you're you have your, yeah, your actually, eyes set I, on? I wrote a screenplay. I wrote a screenplay that I'll be hopefully directing this summer, uh, COVID permitting. It's called As Sick as They Made Us. Um, Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen are starring in it, as well as Simon Helberg from Big Bang Theory. Um, so that's a screenplay that I wrote, and I get to direct it. That's really you know, enormous and exciting. Um, honestly, the podcast, you know, I would love it. I would love it to grow into as much as we can make it grow into if we can be a source for mentorship for people who aren't ready to get into therapy, but need guidance about what might work for them. I would love to see, you know, Mind Bialik's Breakdown uh, take on more of that. Um, and yeah, really just waiting to retire <laughs> and get to nap all the time. <laughs> Other than checking out Call Me Cat and the new podcast, how can people connect with you after the show? Um, well, BialikBreakdown.com is the podcast website. Um, and I'm Miss Mayam on, uh, on Instagram and all those places. And I'm on Facebook and I exist all those places. <laughs> I'm going to link it all up in the show notes. Mayam, really appreciate all you're doing in the world. Keep thank up the you. great work and, um, thank you for the great chat. Thank you. So nice to speak to you. You too. Thank you.